so we have the, the delight tonight of welcoming Lee Brown, who is joining us from Oregon. Lee originally comes from Bloomington, Indiana, but more than 15 years ago, she moved to Oregon. Her background in music, uh, her background is in music, but her love of cooking took her to Portland, where she studied food and wine at the Western Culinary Institute. This led to a career in wine in the wine industry, and she's currently assistant winemaker for the Marshall Davis Wines. In 2019, she started her own brand, and I have to look again carefully at how to, how to say it, <laughs> Lalati, I have checked with uh, Lalati Wines, and her first vintages will be available later this year. Lee is the daughter of old member Trevor Brown. The family's South African roots are re reflected in Lee's wine as the name Lalati comes from the farm her great-grandfather had in South Africa. So may I suggest you all replenish your glasses yes. and prepare for a fascinating talk from Lee. Let me hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the picture. Yeah. Like Charlie. Right, I'll start sharing the screen. <laughs> Well, thanks for taking the time. Yep, Sarah's going to show a, a PowerPoint that my mom actually helped me make. Thank you, mom. Um, but thanks for spending uh, part of your day with me to talk about wine. Um, I, um, as Sue mentioned, I'm the assistant winemaker for a brand called Marshall Davis out in Oregon. And um, we, um, we make make close to 50 small lot wines. So those range from 50 cases to maybe 200 cases in a lot. And we have anywhere from six to seven clients at a time. And um, what's fun for us is we, um, we make a lot of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, but we also get fruit from Washington State. So we get to make a lot of heavy reds as well. Um, and so I wanted to premise this, that this is how the pictures that you're going to see and how I'm going to talk about winemaking is how we make wine. Um, again, we're kind of, uh, we make a lot of small lots and I'll kind of get into that more as we go. Um, you know, there's a lot of wineries that obviously make much larger volumes than we do. We make probably in total about 10,000 cases a year um, containing those 50 some lots of wine. Um, so we are quite busy and I, I told Sarah to, to sort of maybe mention getting rosé wine because we literally just bottled um, a bunch of rosés on Tuesday. Um, and this is the time of year when a lot of um, producers are bottling and showing their rosé. So anyway, we can go to the first slide, Sarah. So this is a map of Oregon, and Oregon is in the northwest part of the United States. But um, this map stands for American Viticultural Area, and this is a term used in the entire United States to um, represent different um, areas within a state that have their own sort of unique soils or climate topography um, uh, specifically for wine that makes them unique. For example, if you look at the left side of the map where it's quite dark at the top, sort of dark brown, black, um, um, there's uh, an area of wine with my boss. And um, Oregon is really famous for Pinot Noir. You may, may have heard that or may not know that. Um, our climate is really similar to Burgundy, France, which is where Pinot Noir is most famous. And so there's a lot of Pinot Noir in our valley. And Yamho Carlton um, is well known for Pinot Noir in styles that have a little more, more um, well, it has a very sedimentary soil. So it often has a little more minerality in the wine. Um, darker fruit, more heavy spice driven flavors. Whereas if you go a little bit north in that same area of the map, probably the most famous part of Oregon is called the Dundee Hills. And the Dundee Hills um, has volcanic soil and it's very red, it's heavy in clay. 
And these Pinot Noir often have more ripe cherry, cherry cola, just much fruitier, brighter um, wines. And a lot of wineries or winemakers or producers, um, even if they're based in a specific AVA, meaning like their winery is there, they will probably either have a vineyard or buy fruit from other AVAs, just so they have something to blend with or play with, um, either to create its own unique blend or to really represent a specific part of that part of Oregon. And the Willamette Valley is definitely the most famous part of Oregon for Pinot Noir. Um, and Pinot Noir, um, I don't know if anyone drinks a lot of Pinot Noir, is um, usually a lighter style red and the grape itself is very thin skinned and Pinot means um, pine cone because it's a really tightly bound cluster. Um, so it's very sensitive to things like rot and mold. And um, so it's also slightly more expensive varietal to maintain and take care of. But in Oregon, we have, we don't really have the extreme weather typically um, that, you know, other, well, like California is much warmer and drier. We have very wet winters. Um, so we kind of ripen a bit slower. And we also have the, uh, the really nice cool nights in the summer and warm days. So. Um, it's, it's never typically extreme heat, which again, this, this particular varietal is very sensitive to. Um, Oregon also, also is becoming famous for Chardonnay. Um, definitely a different style than California. Ours are more lean. Um, again, more of a French style. Um, and then other parts of Oregon, um, like Southern Oregon and then like Columbia Gorge area, you'll find a much wider range of grapes um, sort of heavier red, what I like to call heavier reds, like your cabs, your Merlots, um, and other sort of unique varietals. But Oregon is, again, very famous for Pinot Noir. Okay, so next slide. There we go. So in Oregon, harvest typically starts around the month of September. That's when we start to get real stressed and busy. Um, and um, this is just a picture of one of the vineyards that we work with in Oregon, and that is Pinot Noir. Um, the vintage can, as far as when we start, it can, we can start in early September. We could start as late as the end of September. It really just depends on how the grapes ripen from beginning to end and then how hot the summer is. And also September can be the most amazing month in Oregon or very wet. So rain is a big issue of like, when do you wanna pick? Um, so yeah, next slide. So speaking of picking fruit, one of the big things we look at are the sugar, um, sugar levels in the grape. Um, and the way we measure sugar is um, using a measurement called BRICS, which is in that far left column. BRICS is a French term, um, which is used in the United States as well. The other terms you see there are from other countries as far as how they measure. Specific gravity is actually how you measure it in beer. Um, but the sugar content in the grape will also tell you the potential alcohol, as you can see on the right. And everyone sort of has their own opinion on when to pick, but the way you measure bricks is um, either using a hydrometer in the lab or a refractometer in the vineyard. And you're just focusing on the actual liquid in the berry for, to find the sugar. Um, the other things you look at most importantly too would be acid levels. So we focus a lot on the pH of a wine or, or juice. Um, so if it has a low pH, what we would call a low pH would be something like 3.2. That is a very acidic or highly acid based wine versus something that would be like 3.7. That's going to have a lot more sugar. So as grapes ripen, the acidity goes down. Um, so what did in flavors in the grape, you don't want it to just be super sweet um, because you want to have that nice cutting edge of acid. 
Um, we also look at how crunchy the seeds are, um, if the plant itself is lignified, meaning the woody part of the plant is turning to a nice brown color, and that's showing you that um, it's pushing nutrients into the grape itself. Um, and um, another example of the bricks, so like when we pick Chardonnay, we like to not have them super sweet, so we would pick them around 20, 21 bricks. Again, because we personally like a little more acid in our Chardonnays, whereas Pinot Noir, it might be closer to 20 to 23. And then for our heavier reds, um, which again, we mostly get out of the state of Washington, you want it to actually to get quite ripe. So we would prefer it to be as minimum of like 25 bricks and up. So those are also gonna be higher in alcohol as well. Uh, but in general, you really just, you're focused on balance. It's not just sugar, it's not just acid, it's just how does this all play together, like cooking a meal. Okay, next slide, Sarah. So we're gonna start, that's me <laughs> um, being silly, uh, the, uh, we're gonna start with uh, talking about red wine production. Um, so typically, what happens is when you pick fruit, we, most of our fruit is hand harvested. Um, however, a lot of bigger vineyards do do some mechanical harvesting. But in general, especially for people you want to pick in the mornings um, where it's nice and cool, you want to make sure the fruit doesn't get too warm because it could potentially start to ferment on its own. And and we personally like to have full control of that. You can sometimes um, keep fruit cold in like a refrigerated truck. Um, I used to work and it was sort of first come first serve to use equipment. So if you weren't first in line, you wanted to keep your fruit cold. So we would keep it in a very large truck. truck until it was our turn to process it. And it comes in these totes. And the, that's my boss, Sean, driving the forklift. And he's dumping that fruit into the base of this sorting line. And that's a big hopper. Um, and then the, the next photo come. Oh, sorry, the next slide. Would be, there we go, sorry. So this is is that other end of that sorting line. And what people are doing is they're removing MOG, which stands for material other than grapes. So that could be leaves, it could be rocks, it could be bugs, it could be fruit that has rot on it. Um, and so this is an important part of the process because you want the fruit to be nice and clean. Um, and that uh, is how we process all of our red wines. So you can go to the next slide. This kind of doesn't give you the perfect example of what happens next, but that's the top of the sorting line. And um, there's two things you're seeing here. One is um, this is a very large vat or vessel that my boss really likes to use for fermentation and also for um, storage. Essentially, that's a vat that holds about five and a half barrels worth of um, final product wine. Um, and what we're doing here is dumping that fruit directly from the sorting line into the vat. And so that fruit still has its stems on it. And that is something called whole cluster fermentation. And the stems um, can add a nice, um, almost like a green, um, fresh, texture to the wine. So we like to, if the fruit is very high quality or clean, we might do some partial whole cluster um, just to get some of those flavors. But just beyond that vat, again, this isn't the best photo, but that is what our, that's the distemmer. So this sorting table goes up into another hopper and that goes into the distemmer and the distemmer has a large auger in it that has a sort of basket wrapped around it. So the auger flings the berries into a fermentation vat, which is hiding just behind this cask. And then there's another bin to the right of the uh, 
distemmer that takes the stems. So mostly you're fermenting grapes, just the grapes itself. Um, so you, again, you're kind of seeing two things here um, as far as the process for red wine. Okay, next slide. So this is probably one of the most fun big car wines in really small lots. The bins, those are my feet that I'm, so I'm standing on these. These fermenters, these fermenters are, we usually put, put about one and a half tons of fruit in the fermenters. And um, we, we inoculate all of our ferments. So we use cultured yeast. Not everybody does this. Um, I would say most people do. If you inoculate, you're sort of helping predict the fermentation and the um, sort of coaxing the ferment along. And you also really want your ferment to complete its process. Um, a lot of people too, who don't do this um, are relying on the yeast that comes from the vineyard or maybe in the walls of the winery. You know, just like a bakery, there's yeast on everything. And so those have their own flavors, um, but they can be highly competitive. So we use quite a strong yeast typically. Um, granted, we use different yeast for different wines, but um, that helps us get our ferment started. And what happens in each bin and when you're fermenting anything, is you're creating three things. You're creating CO2, heat, and alcohol. And um, the CO2 specifically pushes all of those grapes to the top of your fermenter or your vat and creates what's called a cap. And um, in order to extract color and flavor, you want to mix this up. And we, the term that's used is called punch down. So that tool that's in my that I'm that sort of metal plunger helps us break the cap and mix it up. So all that foam over there is where I've just punched down and the right is where I've still got work to do. And we do this process typically twice a day until the ferments are almost done. And then we might do it once a day and then we may just completely stop. Because at that point, um, the, the cap will just fall away and everything is just pure alcohol. Uh, an important thing to note too is CO2 is a very big serious thing in wineries. Um, you want to have good ventilation and fix with the oxygen in the room. So I would say probably every year somebody dies of asphyxiation from CO2. If you take the lid off a fermenter and stick your head in there, you I mean, it'll just take your breath away. Um, so it's a, an important factor in wine production, but it's a really good workout. It takes us a couple hours every time we punch down um, all of our ferments. Okay, you can go to the next slide, Sarah. Um, so this is kind of a fun example of like start to finish of doing a punch down. So I'm standing on the vat that you saw on that picture outside near the distemmer. So that first is a very solid cap. The next is me getting a good plunge in. And then the last is sort of the foaminess of um, a fully mixed ferment. Um, again, it's a really good upper body workout. <laughs> okay, next slide. Um, so after your wine is completely fermented, um, we, I don't have a picture of this, but you um, you want to get whatever natural juice has settled out of those fermenters out first. That is called the free run ju juice, and that is the more primo um, wine. Um, and so I put what we call a torpedo. It's sort of a very long sieve that goes into the vat, and then we stick a hose in it, um, and then we drain all that free run and into a pan that. It goes into barrels. But whatever's left, you've got berries full of alcohol and all that good stuff. You don't want to get rid of that. So what we do is we press it. So um, what I'm standing on there is our press. And the, the remaining fruit that hasn't been, uh, or that you know, still has juice in it, goes, gets dumped into that hopper at the top. And that central part is 
sort of the barrel of the press and inside that barrel is, is um, a bladder and as you're pressing the wine, you, we have programs in this machine, um, the bladder is constantly inflating and deflating at various pressures. And then that juice falls, it has its own sort of sieve into, we call it a pan. It's like that square metal piece underneath. That juice then and falls into the pan. And then we pump that juice into a tank that then settles overnight. And then we use gravity flow to take that settled juice into barrels. So that's kind of the next step for red wine. So you can go to the next slide, Sarah. So I just thought this would be a fun photo to show you um, about barrel maintenance. So we typically order our barrels this time of year, spring, um, I mean, specifically new barrels. Um, but then we often have barrels that we use multiple times um, that we store um, over winter or in the summer. Um, and barrels that don't have any wine in them, um, we use a solution mixture of citric acid and sulfur with water to keep them sterile inside. Um, but then what we do when we're ready to use them is we dump that solution out and then we steam the barrels. And the steam is sort of a natural disinfectant or sanitizer of the barrel. And um, it can be fun, it can be boring, I don't know, but it, you stick that sort of hose into, that, into a barrel and it creates all this steam pressure. And you're, not only are you sanitizing it, but you're also checking to see if this barrel, it will fully seal if it's hydrated enough. So you'll heat the barrel up quite hot and then you take that stem out and you put a bung in it. And if you have, if you can pull a, a lot of vacuum, essentially you've got a sealed barrel. And in the right picture on the right is my, my niece came to help during harvest this year. And that's our intern sitting next to her. I showed them how while you're steaming barrels, which is kind of a long process, you can also do yoga and stretch your back out. It's usually really sore and tired. So there's a lot of that. And it's also kind of a good picture. You can see all those bins. Those are all fermenters. And yes, they're covered with bed sheets. Um, it's sort of a strange thing to look at, but the room gets quite full. So that's our cellar. Okay, so, so now we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to kind of flip flop here, we're going to talk about making rosé and white wines. Um, we'll kind of, we can, we're going to talk, we can talk more about your rosés maybe at the end. Um, but you can go to the next slide, Sarah. Um, white wine and rosé is typically made the same way. Um, not always, but we make it the same way. So what we do is that fruit gets picked, um, whether it be white or red. So rosé is made from red grapes. Not everybody knows that. Um, and this picture kind of shows you, this is Syrah. And so we made a rosé of Syrah this last year. So that's the fruit, fresh and pretty. And then in the middle is what it looks like after it's been pressed. And then the picture on the right is the juice in the pan. And so we don't, um, we don't put it on the sorting table. We literally just take the bin and we dump it in the press, everything all together and get the juice off pretty much as quickly as possible. Again, this is the same way we do white wine. Um, so if it were Chardonnay, this is what we would do. For rosé, um, we, we just want a nice light color. We, um, so we just press it gently um, to get a nice pink color. If you wanted it to be darker, you could let this fruit before you press it sit longer, just in a cold storage area. We did this for a client once quite dark. Um, and also if you do that, you're gonna and pull other deeper flavors from the wine or the grapes. Um, you can also pull sort of early fermenting juice off of uh, red wine ferment to, 
to make rosé out of that. Um, but this is the method we, we like to use, which is the pretty much the standard. Okay, next slide, Sarah. So for, uh, I just thought this would be fun to show one, one of the, well, the way we ferment uh, white and rosé. So again, the juice is what you're fermenting, not the fruit um, like you would in a red wine. So for our, a lot of our rosés, we put them in um, what we call eggs, these sort of lo or large <laughs> egg-shaped um, vessels. And what's amazing about them is they create sort of a, almost like a convection oven. They circulate. Um, and makes for a very aromatic wine. We don't always do this. Um, a lot of times we'll ferment rosés in just stainless steel tanks for a much more um, sort of clean flavor. Um, and in the next slide, you can see, uh, hopefully it'll come through okay. And there's sort of a video of one of our little eggs fermenting actually um, a white wine, um, but it's sort of bubbling away there. Um, and it makes for a really great smelling room. Um, so I don't know if people can see that, but there it goes. <laughs> okay, you can go. Go to the next slide. So when we ferment our barrels, we just don't fill the barrels completely, just like the red wines. It's going to build up this one totally overflowed um, as they do. And once they settle down with the initial fermentation, um, we'll top the barrels up, up um, but make sort of a delicious mess to clean up. Um, and it's a party. <laughs> yeah. So, um, a lot, again, a lot like this last bottling we did this week, we, we bottled a lot of our white wines and our rosés. Um, so we let our whites and rosés sort of finish their fermentation over the winter. And then um, before you bottle, an important step to note in white and rosé is a process called cold stabilization or cold stabilizing the wine. Um, you put the wine into tanks and you chill the tank um, to about 34, 35 degrees. And what you're doing is there's a bunch of tartaric acid that's naturally in wine and you're essentially shocking it out of solution. Um, this is actually where our, um, cream of tartar comes. And the reason you do this is and it, the tartaric acid once it comes out of solution is like little fine crystals and you do this because if you didn't um, prepare the wine for this cold temperature if you bought bottled that wine and then the consumer sticks it in their very cold fridge the tartaric acid is going to be shocked out of solution and then you're going to have all these little crystals in your bottle this is not terrible, you can still drink it, it's not bad for you, but it's obviously not pretty, it's not something maybe you'd wanna have in your glass. Um, and um, the other thing we do is we add bentonite, um, which sounds very alarming, I'm sure, which is essentially a clay. And um, it binds to um, a lot of the particles in wine that cause haziness. Um, so you don't want your wine to be cloudy in the glass. Um, so we just dump, we hydrate bentonite, which, which looks like mud and we dump it into the tank, tartrates that stick to the tank too. And I just thought I'd show this picture. Sure, because you know, wine is not as luxurious and we'll think it is messy business. So this is what's left after going through this process. It often looks like paint. It is the most vivid colors you've ever seen. And it's thick and it's messy and it's, I don't think it's that gross. My boss thinks it's gross. I think it's kind of cool, but um, it's, it's amazing stuff. So I 
that's what's happening in this photo. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we're going to go back to red wines now, just sort of the timing of the year. So in the winter months, um, we test, we check our red wine barrels. So we ferment all of our red wine in barrels, or sorry, age them rather, but um, red wine goes through two fermentations. Um, the first one that you saw in those initial pictures is, you know, from the fresh grapes, but it goes through a second fermentation in the barrel. And this is called malolactic fermentation. And I would say, pretty much all the red wine you drink from anywhere in the world has gone through malolactic fermentation. And um, you can do, you can jumpstart malolactic ferment, sorry, fermentation by, as you're filling the barrels with that initially fermented um, wine, you can inoculate with a bacteria. It doesn't take much. Um, you can also kind of let it happen on its own. We actually don't inoculate our second, but um, what happens in malolactic fermentation is there's naturally a lot of malic acid in wine. And malic acid, you could correlate with Granny Smith apples or a very tart, tart apple, something very tart, um, which isn't as pleasing necessarily in wine. Um, whereas lactic acid is much soft, it's you know, softer on your palate, sort of that milky, it's not milky flavor, but it's just a more soft acid. And um, so that's the conversion that's happening in the barrel. And this just sh shows you one of the ways you can test it. This is a, this is chromatography paper, which is, um, there's little dots on the bottom of the page where I've used little um, capsules to extract bits of wine from each barrel. We do each, we test each barrel. And at the bottom of the page is um, those dots that are yellow. That's your tartar, it's showing you where the, that everything has tartaric acid. The middle is the malic acid. There's a handful of dots. The top is your lactic acid. So if you notice there's like, I don't know, like four or five in the very middle that have not finished malolactic fermentation. So we just keep checking because we want to ensure that our red have gone through, fully gone through this process. We will um, add a little bit of liquid sulfur to the barrel. Sulfur is also a way to stop a fermentation essentially, and also to keep your wine healthy and clean. Um, for white wines, uh, we personally don't actually like them to finish malolactic fermentation all the time because we really like to have um, a really new go, go through that cold stabilization process I was showing you. You lose a lot of acid and you you kind of want to have higher acid levels before you go through that process because you want it to be there little to have a little bit left. So the way we test is we just taste white wine barrels every week <laughs> um, um, to make sure. It, okay, do we need to stop this now, or okay. does it need more time? Um, and again, you would stop that with sulfur. Okay, next slide. So um, the other thing we do is a lot of barrel tasting and blending. Um, and we do this sort of mostly in the winter time, um, spring time for our reds. Um, it's not as fun as it sounds. It's a lot of tasting. It can be really overwhelming, but it's an important part. Um, it is fun, but we, um, you know, we do a lot of different wines. And even if you have, um, you know, wine, one lot of wine that all comes from one venue to see, okay, what is our final wine gonna taste like?
Oops, sorry, next slide, Sarah. Be free. So before we bottle, so this past Tuesday was our first bottle, partly because we have so many clients, but also also because some wines age longer than others. So for example, our bottling in March are mostly gonna be wines from 2019. And I also failed to mention when you see a vintage on a wine, that is the year the grapes were picked, not the year it was bottled. Um, so some, again, some wine spends more time, some, some spends less. Um, so anyway, we, we bottle basically all through summer and then it's harvest. Um, but another thing that we do is filtering. And this is something we bring in help for. This is a machine called a cross flow filter. Um, and it is a very expensive piece of equipment. Um, and it has these little straws that have little holes. And what, what is, I'm not the best at ex explaining cross, uh, cross flow, but essentially the wine goes in and is getting pushed gently horizontally through these straws and then up um, and it just keeps cycling until it has a cl very clean wine and the great thing about cross flow and filtering is it also helps get any maybe residual particles or you know things that are still in the wine that you maybe didn't get cleaned out of while you were doing other like little like letting it settle and it gives you that security of making sure there's not a single live yeast cell left as well um, you don't have to filter wine and i would say most wine risk if you don't filter that maybe they will re-ferment in the bottle making it somewhat fizzy like a sparkling wine maybe Maybe not fully fizzy, but pretty when you filter, it's kind of amazing. It, it just really brightens up the wine, it brightens up the flavor. It just, it kind of makes it all come together and pop. Um, so I think the next slide shows you the straws a little better. Yeah, so just shows you white wine going through the filter and red wine um, in this process. Okay, next slide. So um, this was the other day. <laughs> um, we, I, like I mentioned, we bottle six times a year. February is the first month we bottle. And we did about 12,000 cases that day. And, and we did nine wines, which was a lot. Uh, there, oh no, sorry, five rosés and four whites that we did. Um, and we bring in a truck. We don't do this ourselves. Um, I mean, we don't own this bottling truck. A lot of wineries, well, some wineries have their own bottling line. Thankfully, we don't because it's just too, it's a very specialized expertise as far as running this equipment. Um, but um, it's not the best photo that kind of shows you the inside of the truck. Um, so somebody dumps glass um, onto that line and then there's people maybe putting the capsules on the wine or helping getting the corks in and the foils and then at the very end you see two women over there they're actually taking the final product of wine and putting it in a box and then that gets put on a pallet so you can go to the next and they're long days <laughs> they're not fun <laughs> so that's the pallets that's sort of the end of the line um, and we just, we bring in a ton of glass um, and what makes it challenging with multiple clients is everybody wants their own glass, they want their own label and whatever. <laughs> so we get hyper organized. Um, so yeah, it was a really cold day too. <laughs> um, okay, next slide. Um, so this, um, just thought I'd mention this. We, you know, everyone knows or seems to know about the fires in California that have happened for the last few years. Um, we experienced our very first touch of wildfires in the valley, um, at least in my lifetime. And it was really stressful. Um, it, 
um, we had a pretty dry winter last year. And so these winds came in and just ignited the state. <laughs> Um, and actually it was very serious. One of my friends, part of her house burned. Um, I almost evacuated my home. I live out in the Valley. And, um, and this can be serious business for grapes. You can go to the next slide, Sarah. Um, this is a very <laughs> smoky vineyard. Um, I had never experienced smoke in a, you know, in a wine experience, Australia to mention one of our clients is from Australia. Um, and we did reach out to them for advice because what can happen is you can have something called smoke taint, um, get into your grapes. And what's really challenging is it smoke taint binds to, it gets on the skins, but it really binds to the sugars in the grape but you can't taste it until the grapes start to ferment. So you could walk through a fire burned, you know, smoky vineyard and taste a grape and it could taste perfectly delicious until you start to ferment it. And then it starts to smell like barbecue sauce or bacon. Um, and so what we did was we, um, we pressed the fruit to get it off the skins and, um, we, we've been lucky we didn't, we don't have a ton of it sitting around in our barrels that we've noticed, but, um, a lot of wineries were like one of our clients, her total, I mean, her fruit was just completely compromised. Um, this is the reality of insurance for vineyards for smoke. Um, so it was, it was really really stressful Most of our wines were fine I was lucky with my wines because all my fruit came from Washington but um yeah just thought I'd mention um some of the the challenges one has in making wine <laughs> um so anyway, I think that's my presentation um I hope that was interesting I it's probably hard to see. I have a bunch of my own rosés here <laughs> that we just bottled just to show you kind of the different colors that came through. Um, but uh, this isn't even all the rosé that we bottled the other day. There was a couple more. Um, but uh, yeah, it's the time of year to drink rosé. Anyway, I, you know, I didn't realize there were chats down there um, so maybe, sorry, I didn't mind, it didn't come up on my screen until now. So maybe people could ask those questions again. If you unmute yourselves or I can. Yeah, I can. Oh, here, in the punching. Oh, I see someone asked in the punching down. Oh, do I jump into mm -hmm. the grape vats? No. <laughs> Uh, people have, can, you can fall in them. <laughs> I've definitely gotten quite messy. Um, sorry, Don, you asked, or Dan, what is the balance between chemical measurement and tasting in making decisions in the winemaking? Do you primarily, primarily cork or screw top your wine now? Um, it's, I, as far as your first question, chemical measurement and tasting, it is, very much both. Um, I would say mostly taste, however. Um, the, the chemical part for us is mostly making sure our um, sulfur levels are always at a safe place. You wanna have um, uh, a very clean environment in your wine. Not everybody uses sulfur, um, but most people do. Um, I find it to be a really important part of winemaking, um, again, to make sure not, no bacteria gets in your wine, that your wine is safe and clean. Um, so when we're, te when we're doing more of the chemical measurement, that's part of it, but also for um, when you're picking, like I mentioned, pH is a huge, huge one. But once you're kind of, you know, you've got alcohol, you're mostly focused on your 
sulfur management and your flavors and keeping your barrels safe. Um, we mostly use corks on our wines. Granted, all the ones you saw are all screw cap. For mo all of our rosés, we use screw cap. Um, some of our whites, a handful of reds, do we use screw cap. They're usually lower price point um, wines um, for that. Um, and then so, oh, you also ask, can you wash the smoke? Um, sadly, not really. It's not really worth the effort. Um, I, I know people tried, um, but I, you're kind of, you kind of got it. You got to just deal with it. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. I mean, I didn't even see it on the grapes personally. Um, I noticed it in once you started it get going. Um, but yeah, some people I think tried that, but it, I don't think it really makes that much of a difference, sadly. Could I ask one more question during my time of at course. Trinity? At Trinity, yeah. we, we enjoyed a lot of Chateau Neuf de Pop. How might uh -huh. that taste differently than your, different from your rosé? Uh, well, Chateau Neuf de Pop, so that's a region in sort of Southern Rhone. And Chateau Neuf de Pop is allowed to blend, um, I believe it's like 14 grapes into their reds specifically. And they're going to be much, there's no Pinot Noir, first of all. Um, it's going to be a lot of like Syrah, Grenache, Mouved, um, just heavier reds for sure. Um, that's one of my favorite places to drink water from Chateau Neuf de Pop, but if, um, I know there's like Taval, uh, like more northern Rhone, you're going to see some rosés. Again, those are made mostly from like Syrah, Grenache. We did a um, we did a rosé of Syrah this year for my label, um, and, and it definitely has a little more heft to it. It's not heavy as far as like thick or anything, but it um, it just maybe has some a little more um, sort of deeper fruit flavors to it. Um, so hopefully, I answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, okay. But yeah, drink Chateau Neuf de Pop. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I think any got any other question. questions? Sue's asked um, something about, are there rules about when you- Oh, did she, harvest? sorry. No, yeah, that's all right. She says- Oh yeah, it's, okay. Are there rules about, uh, um, about when you can harvest entirely left up to you? Yeah, we don't have as strict rules in um uh in oregon or in the u.s uh, um yeah like for example where they make pinot noir if you buy a wine that says burgundy on it it is pinot noir there's nothing else in there but pinot noir um and if you buy a Chablis, it's Chardonnay. Um, it's a little harder to read labels typically from another country because they don't always have to tell you what's in it, but they're only allowed to grow certain grapes in certain parts of the world um, to then bottle. Um, uh, so it, it's, it, we, don't, we don't have those same restrictions. The only restrictions you really have are, um, you just have, like if you blend, a blend of, you can only blend so much into it you know if I say this is Pinot Noir I can only um, I think it, it depends on the state I could probably put 10 percent Cabernet Sauvignon there and not have to tell you I could still say this is Pinot Noir but um, yeah and then some places they are strict on when you pick and uh, we don't have that thank goodness Lee how many people does, does it everybody have? like the drinking? What's that? Oh, how many people, you said you hand harvest the grapes or they are hand harvested. How, how many people does it take and how long? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. It really depends on the work or the workers that, avail that are available. Um, <laughs> excuse me, here in the US, um, most of the people that harvest are um, Hispanic 
and um, they do a lot of the harvesting of many crops um, in the United States. Um, so it just depends on um, if the crew that's available based on maybe the vineyard manager, manager's crew. It was really challenging this last year because of COVID because they had to be, you know, six feet apart. Uh, it was much slower. Um, the other thing is some companies charge or pay by the hour. Some people pay by the bin, so pay the workers. So obviously if you get paid by the bin, you're going to pick faster than if you're getting paid by the hour. Yeah. Um, so it just depends, it really depends on the company, but as far as like the winemaking, it, yeah, it depends on the volume, like but pretty much all year, it's just my boss and I, but then during harvest, we always hire an intern and then just beg people to help us. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we produce about like 130 tons of fruit, which equates to close to nine to 10,000 cases. Sounds like a lot of wine. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. Like uh, I have friends who make, you know, hundreds of tons of fruit, but they make large quantities of one wine. Whereas we make tons of these little, you know, little things. So, yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> Do you sell your wine all around the world? Um, we don't, sadly. I mean, our Australian client, they, um, they sell, obviously, in Australia, but they sell a lot in China. Right. Um, yeah. Um, and most of the clients we have strictly sell in Oregon. We have one client in Utah. Um, but, um, so everyone sells it in their tasting room or, you know, online. Still working on um, um, figuring all that out for myself because I personally do not own a tasting room. Um, mm -hmm. I just um, hope. So is it something you're looking to do or do you not have a big enough one to be able to sell? This is my one. No, I'm really small right now. So obviously I have a rosé to start. Um, and then I'm bottling a, um, a Primitivo in April. And Primitivo is Zinfandel. Mm -hmm. um, that's the Italian word. And then uh, I'll have a Grenache this summer and a Syrah next year. And, mm -hmm. you know, the thing with wine is it takes a while to build a brand. Um, so I'm hoping... Sounds good. To just mostly sell direct to consumer. See where it goes. Yeah. Does everybody, anybody have a comment about their rosé they're drinking? Is it delicious or? Very nice. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> rosé is always very easy to drink, I find. Yes. Yeah. I think a lot of people think rosé is meant to be sweet and it it doesn't um rosé is as i mentioned is made from red grapes and it's as sweet as the ferment as the winemaker wants it to be so they may not want it to ferment all the way or they'll most of the time it's completely dry fermented dry so they're wonderful wines for warm days that hope they will come soon yeah. oh. well thank you so much for giving up your well, time to do this <laughs> Really fascinating. Oh, sure. <laughs>